from the studios of Latitude Media and Canary Media. I'm Shail Khan, and this is Catalyst. The urban legend states that um, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein in, I think, 1916 in Lake Geneva because a volcano erupted in 1915 in Indonesia, and that caused basically global cooling. So that's the story. It may or may not be true, but I like it. I like the story. I don't think it completely answers Ben's question. <laughs> it definitely does not. But 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 I, what, what I guess I would say is like, you might have lower solar production. I have no idea what you would expect to see in terms of solar generation. But what you definitely would see happen if there was a volcano that erupted at that scale is a temporary but significant global cooling effect. Catalyst is brought to you by Baiva RE, a leading global renewable energy developer, service supplier, and distributor. With over 22 gigawatts in their project pipeline, Baiva RE is rethinking energy every day and at every level. Committed to being a solid partner for the long run, Baiva RE wants to work with you to help shape the future of energy. Get in touch or learn more at www.baivare.com. That's B A Y W A dash re dot com or follow the link in the show notes catalyst is brought to you by SunGrow. for over 25 years SunGrow has been delivering pv inverter solutions across the globe now in more than 150 countries SunGrow solutions include inverters for utility scale and commercial and industrial solar and energy storage systems backed by a dynamic technical r&d team and an in-house testing center SunGrow is committed to clean power for all learn more at us.sungrowpower.com so I suspect that many of you, like me, want to stay up to date on everything that is going on in the world of startups and technology, venture capital, what it takes to grow in today's market in particular. And if so, then you should check out TechCrunch's Equity Podcast. From news rundowns to expert interviews, co-hosts Alex Wilhelm and Marianne Azevedo are here to help you unpack the nuance and the numbers behind the headlines. There's lots to like for Catalyst listeners. They've had recent episodes on... Uh, everything from fusion to space lasers to the LK99 saga, uh, and lots of info on climate tech hardware. New episodes of Equity drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, wherever you get your podcasts. Learn more at techcrunch.com slash podcasts. This week, you asked, we answered, or tried anyway. I'm Shale Khan. I invest in revolutionary climate technologies at Energy Impact Partners. Welcome. All right, we are back with our third ever edition of a mailbag episode or an Ask Me Anything episode. I guess that's the Reddit version of what we're doing here. But for the third time, my friend and colleague, Sarah Golden from GreenBiz, uh, joined us to aggregate a bunch of questions that you all sent in over the past few weeks. Thank you so much for sending in questions. We got a bunch of really good ones uh, that were fun to answer. So keep sending those in. Uh, don't feel like you need to wait around for one of these periodic Ask Me Anything episodes. We'll, we'll try to do it once in a while, no matter what, as, as soon as good questions come in and significant enough volume. Uh, but in the meantime, here is Sarah taking over host duties. I'm Sarah Golden, VP of Energy at GreenViz, and welcome to Catalyst. I am here with your usual host, Shale Khan, partner at Energy Impact Partners, doing our third ever Ask Me Anything with Shale. Shale, welcome to your podcast. <laughs> Thank you. That was a very nice formal introduction. It's better than I normally do. <laughs> well, I love doing these. I love being able to be behind the microphone and ask you questions. And I have a kickoff question for you. So there was a study a few years ago that said that people tend to choose professions unconsciously that resemble their own names. And they found that there was a higher likelihood of like dentists becoming dentists. And my question for you, Shale Khan, is do you think having the name Shale has anything to do with you seeking a career in energy? Uh, I was born, when I was born, it predated like the Shale gas revolution really taking off, but it was... Definitely true as I was uh, as I was growing up. Actually, the closest version of a true story that ties to that is that I was obsessed with rocks as a kid. Not so much energy, but like as a little kid, I had a rock collection. And I remember one time I, I had a 
At some point, my parents had gotten me a bank account and I had like a $50 in a bank account. I had access to it, which was their mistake. And then I went down to our local rock shop at, it was called Bernie's Rock Shop in, that I could walk to in Madison, Wisconsin, where I grew up. And I spent my entire savings, all $50 on a single geode, which was an awesome rock that I think still exists at my parents' house. So I'm not sure about that. Anyway, I was super into rocks, which maybe like ties to now now I spend time in a bunch of subsurface things like mining and I don't know, geothermal and geologic hydrogen, and other stuff like that. So uh so yes is the answer, I guess. That is an incredibly nerdy splurge. It was really cool though. Like it was a big I don't even know how I could carry it. It was like a very big geode. Okay, well, let's jump into some real questions from listeners. And I want to start out with a question from James Hewitt, who works on policy at Breakthrough Energies. Uh, James loved your episode on the electricity gauntlet that played back in August. And I agree. I think this is a great episode that outlines the different buckets of electricity demand increases in the coming decades and all the challenges of meeting them. And James asks... How are you thinking about the load growth near term and long term? And I think specifically what he's referring to is how different technologies will be maturing at different rates and how that will have different impacts on load growth. So in addition to that, he's also curious of whether you think that these spurts will be like regional variations and how what shape that will actually take. Yes, that is a good question. Um, I think that, so everything in electricity tends to be regional. Like there are very few trends that you can point to that occur everywhere in the country, certainly not in the world, all at the same time. Some of that has to do with resources. Some of that has to do with the nature of our electricity sector, which is extraordinarily balkanized and regulated differently in different locations. As it pertains to the load growth, I guess the way that I, my my prior for how this is going to play out is that there's some load growth that is going to be consistent and sort of a building wave. So think of electric vehicles as being an example there. Like the rate of electric vehicle adoption is going to vary from place to place. Obviously, there's places in this country where uh, you have much higher adoption rates than than others today. But in kind of everywhere that EVs start to take off, you probably see a similar S-curve type uh, trajectory. And that the trajectory of EV adoption is going to have a very direct correlation with the load impacts of that. So EVs are this like steadily building wave that you can you can measure on a typical S curve. And then there's the things that are going to be very regionally focused but are going to be much more immediate short term crunches in terms of ability to deliver against that load. That is things like today, you know, manufacturing, right? The manufacturing renaissance in the US tends to be clustered in a few regions that actually uh, takes a lot of load. I think coming in the next few years, green hydrogen is going to be another example. That's also going to be sort of regionally focused in a few key regions for a number of reasons. And that's going to be a bunch of large projects all trying to get grid connected at the same time. And then there's the one that's happening right now and will continue to happen that is like the most intense, crazy version of it, which is data centers. Right. And you can see this is extraordinarily regional because there are these these data center, they're literally called regions that pop up. And once hyperscalers enter those markets, then more hyperscalers enter, then the colos and developers enter, and it just gets out of hand really quickly. And you can see this in like the places that are completely overrun now, which is places like Northern Virginia, where like there is a the queue for new load coming from data centers alone, I think is larger than the entire capacity of the system today in that region. You know, other places like Atlanta, Georgia Power just filed an amended integrated resource plan that's going to add, I want to say it's something like another six gigawatts of capacity over the next few years to meet new load that is some data centers, some some industrial load. So like those things, they they're much more location specific, but they happen much faster than what you'll see with something like electric vehicles or heat pumps for that matter, where there's going to be like a traditional consumer adoption curve that takes five, 10 years to play out. I have a question about data centers. I get pitched on data centers a lot and different innovations that are happening there for cleaning, making them uh, run on clean energy and just, you know, how they're going to get energy generally. How much do you see data centers as being on this leading edge of driving innovation for some of these challenges versus being a problem in themselves? 
Um, I think there's some of both. They're a problem in the sense that they're they're just very power hungry. They re- they require a lot of power, and that has to get served somehow. And they're very uh, they're very time sensitive, very price insensitive, and so they can soak up a lot of capacity. That that's the extent to which they're a problem. They're on the vanguard of solutions in a number of ways. I mean, the obvious version is the you know corporate procurement of renewables really at any meaningful scale, largely started with the tech companies. And then the next stage of corporate procurement of renewables, which is moving from annual procurement of renewable energy credits or power to hourly 24-7, that also is being led by the tech companies. And so they're using the fact that they are large consumers of power to push the entire industry in the direction that I think we, we probably would agree is the right direction. And I think you'll continue to see that happen. You'll see some of that happen with the way that they procure backup power and resiliency. And so, you know, though it is a large source of load that uh, that needs to get met somehow, I generally think on balance it's good because those customer sets tend to be particularly progressive when it comes to climate issues and they're willing to put their money where their mouth is and take some risks that that others will not. I mean, another example of this would be like, the first PPA that ever got signed for enhanced geothermal in the United States from from Fervo was with Google. And, you know, first of a kind PPA for a thing that's never been built, that's always hard to do. Um, Google was the one who stepped up for it. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that that I think is generally good. Yeah, and I'd, I'd imagine there's a long history of innovation coming out of what is initially a challenge. So I guess those things work hand in glove. So our next question comes from Andrew Kriegler from Toronto, Canada. And in his question, he references the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Outlook from September on solar photovoltaics. And in that report, it says that global solar markets is hitting new lows in the price of modules at about 16.5 cents per watt. And Andrew characterizes this as a crash in the price of PVs and says that in other past crashes around solar, there's been knock-on effects in manufacturing. So my first question for you is, do you characterize this as a crash in prices of PV? And Andrew's question is, could you talk about your views on whether the input price drops will supercharge the IRA effect or just make it a little safer for those companies who have already decided to invest? Well, okay, I guess to the first question, have module prices crashed? Uh, I think the answer is yes. I mean, you know, uh, solar modules have for quite a while now been a pretty cyclical market. And so they prices run up, they crash, they run up, they crash. Like that this has happened a bunch of times now. So we're in a we're we're in a crash part of that cycle today. As to the question of the IRA effect, I mean I guess there's there's two versions of the IRA effect, right? The IRA um incentivizes the hell out of deployment of solar because it extends the ITC much further. It allows solar to take the PTC instead of the ITC. It introduces the concept of energy communities where you can get a booster and domestic content where you can get a booster. Um, it makes the tax credit transferable, which should op- unlock more tax equities. It does all these things to incentivize solar deployment. And obviously, lower solar module prices is also good for incentivizing deployment, lowers the cost of solar. So will it supercharge that effect? You know, to some degree, I think definitely yes, and particularly in the context of combating the one force that is pushing in the other direction, which is inflation. So you've got, you know, what matters at the end of the day for solar is not the cost of the panel, it's the cost of delivered electricity. And so inflation is increasing that, all else equal, so falling module prices can counteract that to some extent. If you're talking about the impacts of the IRA on manufacturing a solar in the United States, you could make an argument it's going to have the opposite effect, right? Because the IRA introduces a bunch of incentives for for solar manufacturing here. But all things equal, at the end of the day, you're still competing, albeit on a subsidized basis, against imports, um, which are historically lower priced. And when the global module price crashes, that just lowers the benchmark against you, have, which you have to compare yourself if you're a domestic manufacturer. So you could make an argument that you know, module prices crashing today actually makes it harder to invest in manufacturing capacity in the U.S. for solar. Realistically, I don't know that that's actually going to be the case, in part because these are smart companies who recognize these markets are cyclical, and they probably have a view as to the long-term cost trend, and and the incentives are really rich for 
manufacturing in the United States. But, you know, if module prices stay depressed for an extended period of time, I think you would assume relative to an alternative scenario where module prices had been higher, um, that probably would put a dampening effect on the manufacturing buildup. And due to the cyclical nature, it sounds like you're not very concerned about this. I'm not that concerned about it having a big effect on manufacturing. I don't think. Um, I think it's. I think it's a really good thing in the context of competing against rising. I'm like more concerned about high interest rates uh, impacting the solar market than I am about low module prices dampening domestic manufacturing. So on balance, I'll take lower panel prices. So the IRA has been uh, in place for over a year now, and I'm curious what you're seeing right now. Like, what did you not see coming that that from this law that is now coming to be? I mean, a lot of things are still still to come. Um, you know, there's still a bunch of guidance that, that we're waiting on from Treasury, which. I mean, one thing I did not see coming is how long it was going to take Treasury to issue the guidance on stuff like the hydrogen production tax credit and and a number of other areas. Like that's a it's a long time, and and you know these the tax credits were extended for for ten years or introduced for ten years, so one year out of ten is not the end of the world. But it's a meaningful amount of time in like investment decision making um, scale. So I, I certainly didn't see that coming, and hopefully that. You know, we're we're done with that question in the next couple of months, but we'll see. There's no firm date on anything at this point. Um, I think, you know, if you were reading the legislation closely when it passed, the impacts that we've seen on uh, on the market for renewables and energy storage, pretty predictable, you know, generally very positive. Um, I think one thing that has been interesting is the... Um, 45Q, which is the carbon capture credit, you know, it made point source carbon capture way more lucrative. You know, the credit went from, I think, $45 a ton to $80 a ton. And that um, predictably has had a big impact on that market. Lots more excitement about that. But the thing that has been interesting in the meantime is that there were two big CO2 pipelines that have been planned for the Midwest, largely to take uh, CO2 from ethanol plants in the Midwest to to class six wells that you can sequester the CO2 underground. Um, both of those have turned out to be incredibly difficult to get built, to get permitted, more like, which I, which I guess was sort of predictable. You know, we, we don't permit pipelines a whole lot these days in the US, but you might've thought CO2 is a different thing. Instead, these two pipelines, Summit and Navigator, one of them I think is canceled now, and the other one is like rerouting um, it, it's a, it's a, it's difficult. And so it raises an interesting question for the future carbon management economy of, okay, like maybe we can make it economic to capture the CO2 and maybe, maybe the EPA will get its act together and, uh, license and permit classics wells so that we can inject that CO2 underground. If those two things are not happening in the same place, are we going to be able to build pipelines to get them from one place to another? And that appears to be an open question. You mentioned a moment ago the higher interest rate, so I want to jump to a question from Michael Downey with Energy Features Initiative. And Michael asks, to what degree do you think higher interest rates could impact our ability, both in the U.S. and globally, to reach our decarbonization goals? And as one example, Michael points to the recent Orsted offshore wind project that was canceled in part to higher interest rates. Yeah, I mean, there was more going on with the with offshore wind than just interest rates, but that was that that appears to be the straw that broke the camel's back. And like the offshore wind industry is reeling basically as a result of that. I will say on this question of like how big an impact will interest rates have, I have I have an active ongoing debate with Jigger Shah, who our listeners will know about this. He thinks it's it's less of a big deal. He thinks I've been overhyping the the impact of interest rates, but I will continue to overhype it um because I do think it is going to be it's going to be challenging just because it takes time for the market to settle out, right? Like every asset needs to get repriced. Lots of PPAs need to get repriced. Some developers are going to lose a bunch of money because they price things at, you know, rates that are untenable today. Like it's just going to be a pain, a painful shakeout at the, at the asset level for some period of time. I don't know exactly how long, partially because I don't know how long interest rates stay high, but let's say a couple of years. So in, in the grand scheme of things, in the, in the great arc of history, you know, are we going to look back on interest rates in 2023 as the thing that sent us off track on our climate trajectory? Probably not. But um, 
but it will have a meaningful impact on the market. And there's, a, there's specific places where it'll have a bigger impact than others. Offshore wind is an obvious one. Residential solar is another one, right? Which the residential solar market between um, interest rates and some policy changes, particularly in California around net metering, that's a market that might be down over the next year, you know, relative to, to this year. And I think this year might be down relative to last year. So, you know, the, the impact is real, um, it's not going to kill any of these markets, save for maybe offshore wind. But I, I think it's a it's tough. It sounds like you're saying two things. One is the money's more expensive, making these things harder to build. And the other, which is one I haven't thought as much about, is everything will take longer to build because we're needing to figure out what the higher interest rates mean. Is that what you were saying? I don't know that it means you'll necessarily take longer to build build everything I th- because I think there are other factors that are the long pull in the tent, particularly for utility scale things. We've talked a lot about interconnection as an example. Like as long as it's going to take you to like refinance a project, interconnection is probably going to take longer. So it may not be the thing that slows the individual project down, but I think as we adjust to the new interest rate environment and as unit economics adjust and as PPA prices adjust and so on, I think it might just you know, slow down the growth in the overall market. Sure. Our next question is from Susan Abrams. And Susan says she lives in a rural community that's at the edge of her grid's service area. And her town recently passed a net zero resolution, which will require more electrification and therefore more electricity. So the challenge is, she says the town's existing transmission infrastructure is already close to capacity, and she is wondering, where is our advocacy better aimed? Upgrading and expanding grid capacity or increasing battery access and deployment in order to establish a local microgrid? I mean, I think it's probably going to be a somewhat unsatisfying answer to say some of both, probably. I'm generally still a fan of the macrogrid, like I've never been a person who believes that the future will be or should be this balkanized system of lots of small microgrids that don't interact with each other whatsoever. And if you're at the edge of the grid and you've got a connection already, you know, you're you're probably best off from a cost and reliability standpoint upgrading the capacity such that the the macrogrid can continue to deliver power. Um at whatever scale that you need. With that said, those also tend to be the locations where resiliency is most challenging and most important. If you really do care about resiliency, then some version of a microgrid, which is basically to say, you know, backup backup generation plus the ability to island it, potentially with other resources attached, can be good. So if I could choose, I would say, look, upgrade the upgrade the big grid and try to install basically a resiliency-driven system at the local level. But don't try to say, we're going to take our whole community or whatever it is off-grid. You just don't see that working out economically for any customer who has access to the macro grid. That's interesting to hear because I also know that you are quite concerned about all of the interconnections headwinds and the challenges of getting new projects online. Has your view around this shifted at all uh, with all the new studies coming out with the interconnection queue? You mean like the interconnection reforms, all the like MISO is reforming the queue and all those kinds of things? Is that what you mean? I mean, as far as how long it takes to connect a project. Well, I continue to think that that is, generally speaking, getting worse before it gets better. I don't know that a microgrid solves that. It's sort of situational, right? But like, first of all, the 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 big challenge with interconnection is either big big generation or big loads. That's where the problem is the biggest. If you're big, it's a bigger problem. You know, you if you're going to still have a grid connection again, if you're not going to be fully islanded all the time from the grid, you need to be able to deliver the capacity that that you need at peak. That's like the whole system is built for peak. So you still need to be able to deliver that. The purpose of the microgrid or whatever you want to call it is, is to be able to island in the event of a grid outage um, or a demand response event. So there's a little bit of nuance here, right? Where you can maybe 
introduce a scenario. I don't know if this works at the town level, but you could certainly do this for individual customers, large customers, where you say, you know, I need 100 megawatts of peak capacity, but I'm willing to participate in demand response events that look like X, Y, and Z. I can, I can downrate my capacity or shut down for limited periods of time. So there's, there's something in between there. But I, I generally do not think that like the primary solution to our interconnection problem is not interconnecting, if that makes sense. In the last few months, you've had a few episodes that have hit on the, um, that this, we may be actually entering a microgrid moment because of some of these challenges around interconnection. And Alex Sharenko asks um, about the role of distributed energy resources as a potential stopgap measure for these interconnection headwinds. And he asks, are technologies that enable robust always-on microgrids that could be rel- relatively quickly set up undervalued? Asked another way, will microgrids play a significant role in the electrification of our economy, or will they continue to be niche? I, I, this is where I think terminology kind of matters a little bit. Let's not talk about microgrids in the context of this question. Let's talk about distributed generation or distributed energy resources. Because microgrids are a very specific thing. They're a combination of those resources that you can island. Um, and the, the islanding component of it, which is the core component of the making it a microgrid, that's a resiliency thing. And it's good. And there's a lot of customers who want that for a bunch of reasons. Um, but the, I think what you're, the question that Alex is asking is, is more about, can we use distributed generation and or storage and or load control? Can we use distributed energy resources to, to some degree, alleviate the electricity delivery bottleneck that we're starting to see in some places? And I think the answer to that is, is yes. It's probably not a full-scale solution. We still need the, the, the big picture reason why this is a challenge is that we're trying to turn over a massive fleet of electricity generation relatively quickly because we're retiring lots of coal. We're not building a lot of new natural gas. We're trying to add a lot of renewables. We're trying to add a lot of batteries, all, all, all the things, right? And, um, and that still needs to happen. Like I don't see a scenario where you distributed generation your way out of that. But with that said, you know, every, um, every behind the meter megawatt that is delivered, if it is delivered at the right time and the right place, can help alleviate the need for a megawatt or a megawatt hour that's going to get delivered from some generator further away that's hard to hard to get the power to or from rather. So um so I do think that that is valuable. And I think that actually, you know, to the question of is this stuff undervalued, you can make an argument either direction about this. But for example, the changes to the net metering policies in California, which as I alluded to before, is is sort of making it more challenging to install residential solar. The the purpose of them is to really incentivize adding batteries if you're going to do residential solar in California and to use the solar plus battery to deliver that power to the home or to the grid at the right time, which is when the grid grid needs it, right? In that evening peak in the neck of the duck, so to speak. In my mind, high level, without sort of getting into the nuances of that specific policy, like that is appropriately valuing those resources. It's saying if you if the resource can actually alleviate a challenge on the grid, which is which is a real thing in California in those evening peaks, then it has more value than if it's delivering in the middle of the day when, you know, there's an oversupply and we're curtailing a bunch of power. Catalyst is brought to you by Baiva RE. At Baiva RE, they're rethinking energy, how it's produced, stored, and best used to enable the global renewable energy transition. Based in 31 countries with revenues of almost $4.2 billion, Baiva RE is a leading renewable energy developer, service provider, distributor, and energy solutions provider that's actively shaping the future of energy. With over 22 gigawatts in their project pipeline, Baiva RE is rethinking energy every day at every level. Committed to being a solid partner for the long run, Baiva RE wants to work with you to help shape the future of energy as well. Get in touch or learn more at www.baiva-re.com. That's B-A-Y-W-A-R-E.com or follow the link in the show notes. 
Catalyst is brought to you by SunGrow. For over 25 years, SunGrow has been providing reliable and cost-effective solutions for the solar industry. Their inverters provide efficient and reliable power generation to help maximize your return to your solar investment. With SunGrow's expansive power line, you can trust your investment will perform at its best day in and day out. Not only has Bloomberg New Energy Finance rated them as the world's most bankable inverter, but 40% of SunGrow's employees are dedicated to R&D, ensuring products are always at the forefront of the industry. SunGrow has over 340 gigawatts installed globally across 150 countries, from utility scale to CNI solutions to energy storage. SunGrow is committed to providing clean power for all. Learn more at us.sungrowpower.com. Our next question is from Ben, who left a voicemail saying that he's been watching a lot of climate disaster movies lately, and it got him thinking about this solar transition that we've been doing. And he asks, has anybody thought about what happens if we have a major volcanic event and put a lot of pollutants into the atmosphere and how that would impact solar production? And I like this question because it points to how we sort of collectively fail to anticipate all the way things can go wrong when we're mapping these giant transformations. And so I'm curious. Take it away. I have no idea. I have no idea the impact on solar production that you would expect from a volcanic eruption. But I do have a volcano climate-related story, um, actually. So, you know, what we're what we're talking about doing when we talk about solar radiation management or geoengineering, that, that portion of geoengineering, um, is, is very similar to deliberately doing what volcanoes accidentally do, which is spewing a bunch of these, this, this, these sulfur-based um, compounds into the atmosphere. And the story that I like that relates to this, if you want to take an extreme version of what we'd be talking about doing with geoengineering, so in I'm going to butcher this a little bit, so listeners don't Google too closely, but broad strokes. One of the largest volcanic eruptions in history was in 19, I want to say it was 1915. This is where I'm going to get it wrong, but it was a, it was a um, huge eruption in Indonesia. And it was so big that it effectively cooled the planet by something like half a degree Celsius for like the next year um, and had all sorts of weird climatic of effects all over the world, including, so the next summer after that volcano erupts, um, while the world is still feeling all those, those effects, Mary Shelley is in Switzerland in the summer at Lake Geneva, where she's supposed to be vacationing. Um, you know, Lake Geneva in the summer is supposed to be very pretty and sunny and so on. She's at, I, she's with Lord Byron and a bunch of these other former famous people now famous people, I should say. Um, but instead of being like a, a sunny, you know, Lake geneva e summer that she expected, it's gloomy and it's dark and it's cold. And because it's gloomy and dark and cold, she stays inside and she writes and she ends up writing Frankenstein. And so the people, people believe, or the urban legend states that um, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein in, I think, 1916 in Lake Geneva because a volcano erupted in 1915 in Indonesia, and that caused basically global cooling. So that's the story. It's, it's, it may or may not be true, but I like it. I like the story. I don't think it completely answers Ben's question. And I think that there's also a way we... <laughs> it definitely we, does not. But, but, but I, what, what I guess I would say is like, you might have lower solar production. I have no idea what you'd expect to see in terms of solar generation. But what you definitely would see happen if there was a volcano that erupted at that scale is a temporary but significant global cooling effect. Right. As far as the solar production side goes, we've seen the sun with wildfires as well as blocking blocking the sun and reducing our, our anticipated solar production. Do you have an idea of how meaningful that is or how we are starting to factor that into models? I don't know that it's really getting factored into models. I mean, one thing I will say in general is that we've we've not yet woken up to how much we need to be modeling these more extreme weather events into um, electricity reserve allocation modeling, basically. Uh, there, there's a bunch of data around, so like Texas, another example of this, right? You know, where you see these kind of multi-day weather events now, basically 
every three years or so, pretty predictably. But we're not. But they're, they're each one of them is individually considered to be a one in a hundred year event or something like that. And so we don't we don't yet fully account for them, and that that causes issues. Wildfires maybe being one one among that broader category. Um, you know, we haven't yet. I don't think faced there. There were some concerns when there were wildfires here in California a couple of years ago about. Um, about reserves on the grid. We haven't yet had blackouts or brownouts that you would, I think, ascribe to wildfires. But again, it sort of falls into this category of like, the closer we are to the razor's edge in terms of having enough predictable capacity on the grid, the more things like that or other weather events start to really matter. Yeah, there does seem to be an irony around uh, becoming more reliant on weather-dependent energy infrastructure at a time when weather is becoming less predictable, which is the thing that that weather-dependent infrastructure is is intended to address in part. Yes, I think that is definitely, that's definitely true. And that, that is in part why, you know, in addition to the focus on the weather-dependent stuff, which is wind and solar for the most part, there's also now a big focus on uh, decoupling at least part of our expected capacity requirement from the weather, whether doing that through storage or doing that through other types of generation, you know, geothermal is not really weather dependent, right? Nor is nuclear, nor is uh, a hydrogen fired gas turbine or whatever. So there, there are things that are not tied to weather, but it's true that like we are, we are tethering ourselves to weather more in order to avoid the thing that we know is going to happen to weather, which is that it's going to get more volatile. Our next question comes from Sam, also via voicemail, and Sam points out that our categorization of carbon dioxide removal technologies is unhelpfully large, and it includes things like direct air capture and biomass and kelp farming and forestry practices and land use management. And he says, given the urgency of figuring out CDR, he's wondering why we can't just pencil out what works and what doesn't and then focus our resources accordingly. And he says, I feel like we should have some clear winners, yet in reality, it seems like it's very up in the air. We don't know what's going to work, and we don't know what they should be priced. What do you think? Uh, I sort of agree. I mean, I don't, I like, I think the thing that's happening right now in, in carbon removal world is that there's kind of a Cambrian explosion of different methods that's showing up all the time. So every week there's some new, either new, uh, process to remove CO2 from the atmosphere or certainly new companies that are pursuing a pathway to do that. And part of the result has been, I think what he's alluding to, which is that like, how do you keep track of all the different things you can do from, you know, big machines that suck CO2 out of the atmosphere to, uh, to like you said, biomass sinking and, you know, dropping it into anoxic zones in the bottom of the ocean or the sea or, mineralization on agriculture land or whatever it might be. Like there's a lot out there now and it is confusing. And I think one of the reasons that we can't, or you know, no, no one has, I think really credibly said here, here is the winner is that it's not clear to me that there is, first of all, it's not clear to me there ever will be a winner. Um, nor is it clear to me that there is anything that, that could be a winner. And the reason for that is the way that I think about CDR is that you're looking your your mythical unicorn solution for removing CO2 from the atmosphere has four characteristics. It is cheap, which is, you know, let's, let's call it sub $100 a ton, but like ideally sub $50 a ton, who knows, but it's cheap by whatever metric. Um it is eminently scalable, so you can do gigatons worth of it without disrupting some other ecosystem or causing some some really big knock-on effect. So it's cheap, it's scalable, it's durable. Um, so whatever, you know, the, the mechanism that you use to sequester the CO2 will remain sequestered for, and this is where there's debate, right? Is it hundreds of years? Is it thousands of years? Is it 10,000 years? I don't know, but it's durable by whatever definition you want to use there. And then it's eminently and easily measurable and verifiable. And if you take those four criteria as the four criteria, basically everything fails on at least one of them. Or if not fails, then like struggles on one of them, right? You can imagine super scalable 
mineralization on agricultural lands, difficult to measure and verify. So lots of companies trying to figure out how to do that better. Direct air capture, incredibly scalable. You could theoretically do it anywhere, you know, easily measurable and verifiable, like fits a lot of those characteristics. Open question price, can it be cheap enough? So the way that I I see it today, like there are a lot of really promising options, um, but the reason why we're pursuing all of them simultaneously is that none of them have yet like fully disproven the notion that they're going to fall down on one of these four pillars. And until we until we know, and realistically, again, I don't think there's going to be one that's going to win out. We're going to do some combination of a bunch of them. We, we need to be pursuing a bunch of paths. But the result is a situation that I, I totally sympathize with Sam's question because it is kind of a mess and it's really hard to, you know, unless you're deep, deep in it, which very few people are, it's really difficult to figure out like what's real, what's not, what's actually happening versus what's theoretical. Um, how should I think about ocean capture? You know, like it's just, it's very confusing. Yeah, it does seem like one of those things where we don't know what's wrong until we know what's right. And what's right will probably be a ton of different things. I'm curious about innovations in that fourth pillar you mentioned around being able to verify what works. This feels increasingly important when we think about land use considerations and biodiversity and and properly valuing these things. I know somebody that's working on a project where she is aiming to work with uh, dairy farmers in California to have them participate in carbon markets and verifying that different practices that that farm uses actually leads to sequestration of carbon. And in order to verify this, they have like a team of PhDs out at this farm. And I hear this and I'm like, well, that's not scalable. Like if we actually want to make this a market, then we need to be able to know this works better and faster and cheaper. So are you seeing anything in that fourth pillar? Totally. I mean, there's, and I should be clear that like there are really smart people working on all of the, both all the pathways and all the solutions to the problems with each pathway. Um, I agree with you that in some of the, like generally speaking, the things that are cheaper today are harder to verify because they tend to be nature-based. This is, this is broad strokes, but let's just, you know, I think this is a true to a first approximation. Um, and the things that are more expensive today tend to be easier to verify because they're engineered and you basically get a pure stream of CO2 you're going to do something with. On that first category of generally cheaper, generally harder to measure and verify, there's a lot going on, right? You're talking about maybe, I don't know what what practices those farmers are going to change, but if it's soil related, there's a bunch of companies who are, you know, introducing new soil measurement, soil carbon measurement techniques, whether via physical infrastructure you put in the ground or through hyperspectral imagery from satellites or whatever it might be. Um, There's, you know, we're getting better and better at like imputing estimates from from samples you know it's still not perfect um and it's a challenge but there's work being done there and there's work being done on all these other ones can you like if you're mineralizing something can you introduce an isotope that you know can be recognized that'll tell you definitively how much co2 you sequestered in the rock um you know these things are all kind of exciting but but there's a long way to go i think to build the trust that's going to be required for the carbon removal market to really scale with any of those technologies. Our next question comes from Phil Keyes at Intertrust Technologies. And Phil has been noticing this trend in the last few years where European energy conglomerates like NL and RWE and Shell and National Grid and Schneider are buying up all of these small energy assets and are also acquiring different climate tech startups in the U.S. And he says that this isn't being covered very much by industry outlets and asks, is this an important trend or am I reading too much into this? Well, I guess first question is for you, Sarah, since you represent an industry outlet at GreenBiz. Do you feel like it's undercovered? Have you covered it? Yeah, I see this a lot in press releases. And generally speaking, I see this as companies recognizing this enormous, enormous potential um, within investing in the clean energy transition and acting quickly. And in the last year, I've seen this supercharged from the IRA. But I also hear about this in press releases, which seems like, you know, not the place you you would put information if you're trying to hide it. So I kind of think of it as more of like a an opportunity to be just expanding into new markets. And so partly I'm curious, like, am I missing something? Is there also something that is there a larger story there that should be covered or a larger trend that you think is worth highlighting? 
I don't know if this is a larger story that needs to be covered or not, but I can tell you the why I think you do see a lot more M&A from European energy companies buying U.S.-based companies, mostly project developer types. Um, you know, first of all, the U.S. is a big market, and it is generally strategic for companies to enter the U.S. if they are international. And, and we have a lot going on here, and especially today, right? Now, thanks to the IRA, in part, like the U.S. is, is the epicenter of some of these markets. Related to that, um, specifically on the energy company side, I mean, one thing that I'm not sure everybody appreciates is that the European um, utility conglomerates or electricity conglomerates tend to be more international by nature and more global by nature than the U.S.-based ones. So if you think about U.S.-based, um, not oil and gas, but just like electricity companies, very few of them have significant operations outside the United States. AES would be an exception to that, but very few others. Whereas if you look at the European majors, and you named a bunch of them, uh, EDF and Enel and, and so on and so forth, most of them do. And so that's one of the reasons why you see it go in that direction and not in the other direction. And then the third I'd say is that, um, and this is true more of sort of molecule world, the um, early movers, the early significant movers in terms of like building up a, a real meaningful business in, in clean energy or new energies as they often call it, have been the Europeans. So think BP and Shell and Total, you know, they, they are all European super major oil and gas companies and and they all got into this game in a more significant fashion relatively early and and were pretty acquisitive when they were getting into it and things like EV charging and so on. So for those three reasons, I do think it is true that if you like added up on a ledger on one side, all the European energy companies that have acquired American clean energy enterprises of one kind or another, and then the American ones that have acquired Europeans, it would be a long list on one side and almost none on the other side, um, I don't think there's anything particularly nefarious about it, but I, I do think it's just a result of sort of the structure of the markets and the players in those markets that differs between the U.S. and Europe. Interesting. I think I tend to romanticize the prescience of the, the European mindset. So there's also part of it for me where it's like, oh, these European companies are recognizing this opportunity that that some U.S. companies may not have fully um, internalized yet. And it's sort of like, well, if they can do for healthcare and furniture, who knows what they can do for clean energy? <laughs> for furniture, yeah. Um, is like, Do you think I have Ikea as prescient or... I think if Scandinavia is just working on the margins now, they're just, they're just working on furniture, just perfecting furniture is what they have left. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that you, could, you could make the argument that they're prescient. You can make make the argument that they're too early, right? And then what's going to happen? You know, I think that uh, the, the alternative to that is like they got into it before it was profitable, and so they have to kind of like at least a profitable on the scale that they are used to. And I'm speaking more about the sort of shells and BPs and totals of the world. Um, and so they got to build up these businesses that that have return profiles that don't look like their core business, and kind of hold those two things simultaneously for a while while one market is maturing and the other one is. Very, very mature, um, and you know if they can navigate that, then they will have this time advantage and um, investment advantage that that they've built up. But but it's no small feat, and you see this happen over and over again, where they, you know, they have to decide whether to double down on investing in this stuff or pull back on investing in this stuff. Either when times are particularly good in oil and gas world, or when times are particularly bad in oil and gas world. So it is like a they're, they're they're walking a tightrope of a sort. The next question we have is from Stefan Suhansky, who works at an agricultural startup in rural Ghana. And Stefan points out that most climate tech VC investments are focusing on developed countries. And he is wondering whether in your thinking about investing in climate tech, are you sort of trusting that these climate tech startups will then pivot to the developing world when the time's right? Or how are you thinking about the global South when you are considering different climate tech investments? I think that's a good question. And I think, you know, it's probably undercovered by everyone, but including myself. Um, I think from... From the question about when I'm thinking about investments, 
uh, it's sort of sector specific. Like there are some sectors that are kind of inherently very global in nature and generally are like big industrial stuff. And you, you hope that a successful technology, if it wins out, is going to end up winning out globally. So steel making would be a good example of this, where like, you know, we've made a couple of investments that can impact decarbonization of steel making, one in a company called Boston Metal, which is an electrification process for steel making, you know, others in hydrogen production, which you can use hydrogen to produce steel, um, another in a, in a carbon capture company. So like the various pathways, I think whichever one wins out or if multiple, multiple of them win out, they will win out on a global scale, including in the global South. Um, so in, in that industry, I do think so, but in many other industries, realistically, it's going to be its own whole thing, right? And like, there's a big universe, for example, electrification of two wheelers, um, whether in sub-Saharan Africa or in India, which is just like taking off in this really cool, crazy, oh, and China as well, for that, for that matter. Um, taking off this totally awesome, exciting to see way. And that I think is not going to be the same companies that like sell electric scooters here in the United States. So some sectors maybe, yes, you see global companies, some sectors definitely not. I know Breakthrough Energy Ventures is really based around this idea of reducing the cost of the green premium by creating new technological pathways for some of these different sectors with the idea that we can drive down the cost and then it'll be just naturally adopted because it'll be the cheaper the cheaper thing within the global south. And I'm curious whether you think there's other sort of infrastructure challenges that would get in the way beyond just the price point of these new technologies, and also whether this is something you think about at EIP as well. Yeah, I mean, of course, right? Prices, it's like table stakes, uh, ultimately, to to reach the promised land, but it's not, it's insufficient. It's necessary, but insufficient. So, you know, I think you, you need to reduce the green premium. Ideally, you have a negative green premium ultimately, in, in as many of these markets as possible. But as we've seen, you know, the world doesn't behave totally rationally. Um, and oftentimes price is not the only variable, right? Something can be more expensive, but better for a bunch of other reasons. Like in the, um, in the utility context, the, the, the way that utilities have to make decisions uh, here in the U.S. often, the, the term that, that gets used is least cost, best fit. So it's a combination of two things to determine whether a particular purchase of a an asset or PPA is, is the right thing to do. So least cost is one of them. You got to sign the cheapest thing, but also least cost, best fit. So just being the least cost is is not enough, right? It has to actually be the right fit for your system, for for your needs. And I think you can apply that more broadly, right? We want we want climate tech at the end of the day to be least cost, best fit in whatever sector. The, the individual technology is in. Um, least cost is probably the harder part to achieve in, in many of these cases. So I think it's right to focus on it, but like I said, it's not enough. Thanks for that, Shale. That is all the questions we have today, uh, but everyone, please keep sending them in. These are fun, and, and I like being able to ask Shale these questions, so keep it up. Sarah, thank you again for the third, uh, but not final, Ask Me Anything at Catalyst. Happy to come back anytime. Sarah Golden is the VP of Energy at GreenBiz. This show is a co-production of Latitude Media and Canary Media. You can head over to canarymedia.com for links to today's topics. Latitude Media is supported by Prelude Ventures. Prelude backs visionaries, accelerating climate innovation that will reshape the global economy for the betterment of people and planet. Learn more about their portfolio and investment strategy at www.preludeventures.com. This episode was produced by Daniel Waldorf. Mixing by Roy Campanella and Sean Marquand. Theme song by Sean Marquand. Help on this Ask Me Anything episode from Anna Rader. And this is Catalyst. Catalyst.